Hello. <laughs> well, uh, it's 202 now. I think we can get started. Um, we have um, um, 40 or um, 20 right now, and the number is still showing. So hello, everyone, and welcome to ASIC SIMNA series. I'm Jiang, the SIMNA coordinator. I will be the moderator with uh, Kathy Medley, who is our communication specialist. Um, and our um, director, um, Dr. Alan Williams, and um, our associate director, Rob Ferrero, also join us. And Alan will be uh, introducing the spe uh, speaker before she gets started. Uh, just so you know that um, the seminar will be recorded um, and the video will be published on our um, uh, YouTube channel. So please feel free to check it out. And uh, this is our first uh, seminar this year. And we managed to put together a fabulous uh, seminar uh, schedule uh, given by outstanding scientists um, from across the uh, uh, fields of Earth system uh, studies. Uh, and you can find our schedule online through our site, um, Twitter, um, and you can add it to your Google Calendar. Um, we will also hold in-person seminars um, uh, this semester, um, every like um, once in a while, um, and please uh, stay tuned. Um, and today we are very excited to have our speaker joining us from Berkeley. And before she gets started, um, our um, director, um, Alan Williams, will be introducing her. So, Alan, please go ahead. Thank you, John. And thank you, John and Cassie, for all your organization in this. And welcome, everybody, to our spring semester seminars. And I'm really pleased that we have a stellar speaker to kick off this seminar uh, series. Manuel Aguirato is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy Management at UC Berkeley. Her research merges cutting edge space technology and remotely sensed observations of the earth with state of the art models for their purpose of improving our scientific knowledge about variability and change in hydrologic cycles. In particular, her research focuses on snow, soil moisture and groundwater hydrology. After earning her PhD in civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles, Professor Gerardo has worked as a research scientist in the Earth Science Division of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt before moving on to become an assistant professor at Berkeley. So Manuela, we're very pleased to have you with us. And um, John, if you could hand over the screen to Manuela, let's uh, enjoy her seminar. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. And let me put the presentation mode on. Let me see, let me know if you see this correctly. It looks great. All right, great. I uh, will just hide the, the little boxes just for convenience and um, I'll get started. So again, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be uh, in a way back uh, in the um, Greenbelt area. Um, so before I get started, I just really want to take a minute to acknowledge um, all the people that have helped me uh, putting together some of the um, slides and, and results that I'll show and work that I'll show uh, today in this presentation. So some of them are listed in the slides and there's many more. So today's presentation, uh, I really just constructed it to be a little bit less technical and to provide a little bit more applications uh, around uh, the work that I've done uh, around land uh, data assimilation. Uh, but before getting started, I just wanted to give a very quick broad overview of what of the data assimilation concept. Um, and to me is, um, I can see it in this way. So uh, imagine you have a phenomenon that um, in this case, I'm showing snow, um, it's, it's no watershed, but imagine you have a phenomenon that you can observe. So we have um, currently observations that we can take, say, from satellites, airborne, in situ observations. Um, and we can also model or, or predict uh, predict this specific phenomenon. Uh, so using physical based models, statistical models, and so on. So the idea behind data simulation is that um, say that we have two, these two data streams of, um, of, of, of 
uh, ways that we can um, estimate this phenomenon. Um, do recognize that either of them um, are good, but they also contain errors and uncertainty. Um, so the idea behind data simulation is to try and leverage upon um, you know, these two data streams uh, together in order to be able to provide optimal estimates of the uh, variable of the interest, again, in this case, snow, uh, by again, optimizing errors around both the um, observations and models. Um, so the uh, way that, again, I structured this presentation is uh, looking at this from a uh, application perspectives. And to start off with, uh, I'll start with um, estimating precipitation errors in graded products. And the reason for that is that one typical critique that we usually get from, um, uh, from, from a land data simulation perspective is the uh, problem that by doing data simulation, we typically tend to adjust states directly. Uh, and by doing so, we mess up a little bit the water balance within models. But uh, if we were able to actually uh, improve, say, inputs to our models, say precipitation, then the problem does not persist anymore. Uh, so the idea, again, uh, uh, looking at a water budget perspective. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, came up with a, um, with a work uh, where we um, uh, created an experiment, a completely um, synthetic experiment, where we were able to control the sources of uncertainties uh, on, on the model. Uh, and we led uh, most of the uncertainties on the um, estimates of terrestrial water storage to be driven by precipitation. So the idea here was, well, if we know what the errors in precipitation should look like, um, and uh, we create a synthetic truth of what the terrestrial water storage look like, say that then we create observations around it, and we assimilate them into our model, our system, can we retrieve uh, those errors in precipitation errors? And as in the representation, this uh, time series shows exactly those uh, precipitation errors. In this case, they were represented by a multiplicative factor of precipitation. So you'll see the black line uh, represents true um, errors, um, true coefficient errors in the precipitation. Uh, you'll see that um, in, uh, in red, uh, you'll see an envelope that represents the interquantile range of prior uh, precipitation errors before assimilating the TWS observations. Um, and the um, blue represents the assimilation. So the overall idea here is that, yes, if we were to know that, uh, again, the precipitation errors are the dominant uncertainty factors in this water budget equation, um, by assimilating directly terrestrial water storage, we could possibly uh, retrieve uh, the errors in precipitation. Um, and not only that, but by doing that, we can also improve um, the uh, various state of the hydrology. And in this case, I'm sure and just improvements again for these synthetic uh, experiments on other variables of the system, such as, of course, um, precipitation, but also uh, snow water equivalent, uh, soil moisture, evaporation, and yeah. runoff. So the problem is that oftentimes in our systems, we don't have only precipitation that is the only uh, um, uncertain factor. But uh, if there is a place where uh, this sort of uncertainty might uh, be, uh, this sorry assumption might be true, uh, is um, when we look at uh, snowfall estimates uh, during winter catchments that are dominated by snowfalls. So as an example on this uh, graphic here, I show a work by a couple of years ago by a colleague that shows um, snow depth estimates in a catchment in the Alps. Uh, so this is in uh, Val d'Aosta in the Northwest part of the Alps. And you'll see that the gauges that measure precipitations, uh, they're all located at lower elevation. So they're possibly not able to uh, provide estimates of what the uh, snowfall and therefore snow depth and snow water accumulation in watersheds might look like uh, at higher uh, watersheds and higher elevations in these snowfall dominated watersheds. And another challenging factor is associated that, well, typically when whenever we do um, hydrological, uh, we run hydrological models, we typically use the best available in a way um, forcing um, data sets. And they usually come from reanalysis. Again, I worked from uh, another colleague a couple of years ago 
she tried to characterize the fact that um, in order to represent snow water equivalent over our mountains, we are really doing a bad job. Like this is showing a snow water equivalent estimates for um, a, a sample watersheds uh, in uh, um, all over the world. I, I don't remember what location these were, uh, but same locations forced by various different forcings. And you'll see that you have a big range of variability along, around the, uh, the forcings, uh, along the estimation, sorry, of the snow water equivalent. So the idea here behind is that, well, if we hope to get snow water equivalent estimates right, that is really the critical variable that we need as snow hydrologists for, um, you know, predicting water resources during the spring and summertime, um, we are kind of like out of luck if we are not able to get current, correct uh, snowfall precipitation in the watersheds. So again, accurate as estimates of snow water equivalent really depends on how accurate um, snowfall estimates are, um, especially over uh, these watersheds that are dominated by snowfall during, uh, during winter months. So um, to kind of like um, reproduce in a way the similar idea of uh, the, the, the work that I presented a moment ago that was synthetic, we said, well, why don't we try to do this in a um, real case scenario? So um, we know that the past three decades or so had seen a revolution of satellite observation. Despite that, uh, we still don't have a, a dedicated uh, satellite mission for uh, snow-driven processes. But um, that said, very recently, we've, th there has been uh, some advancement um, looking at um, Sentinel-1 C-band uh, observations from, um, again, Sentinel-1 observations and um, the work by uh, Hans Levens, um, in 2002 demonstrates that uh, Sentinel-1 can actually provide um, decent uh, snow depth observation at various resolution from 100 to one kilometer every six to 12 days globally. So again, uh, we were looking at the water balance equation a moment ago, and that was written in terms of snow water equivalent. But if we recognize that really snow depth is um, really linked to snow water equivalent through the density of snow, why don't we use uh, this observation or snow depth uh, to constrain um, those uh, precipitation errors that, uh, again, are driven the water balance during winter months uh, in the mountains, uh, in, in the mountains, in mountains watershed. So uh, the idea behind this work uh, is, can we constrain uh, mountains, no water equivalent, that then therefore can feed into stream flow, for example, uh, models uh, by informing um, snow water equivalent and stream flow models using these Sentinel-1 um, novel uh, observations um, of snow depth. So the work uh, um, is still in progress, uh, used again snow, uh, snow depth from Sentinel-1, and this is a representation of what uh, that uh, snow depth looks like for the um, basins, test basins that we're looking at. Test basin that we're looking at is also in Northern Italy. Uh, I'm also from Northern Italy, so I might, live, I might be a little bit biased to uh, the application uh, of this site. Uh, but so again, the first thing that you notice that you use from these snow, snow depth observations from Sentinel, you start seeing some topographic, in a way, uh, patterns uh, where you have most of the snow. Um, and so white is higher snow, um, darker colors is, is shallower snow in the higher elevation. What you don't see is, again, as an, an example here, I'm showing um, era five, for example, land precipitation for one specific day, but you'll see how that uh, might look like uh, for this specific watershed. So much more uh, greedy and a little bit less representative of what the actual topography of the watershed look like. So uh, the test case that we ran use uh, a, um, and I didn't mention that a moment ago, an ensemble batch smoother uh, of um, a particle batch smoother, uh, where we test uh, um, this experiment for both in situ. So we had in this site, we had a couple of sites where we had observations of both precipitation and snow depth. Um, and then we tested over the entire watershed using Sentinel-1 observation. Uh, so to start off the, uh, the work, we had to generate an ensemble of prior estimates of what that precipitation might look like. And uh, without uh, you know, knowing um, 
guessing, uh, you know, what the precipitation might look like. We generated errors that have a log normal distribution around the mean equal one, meaning that we assume that the errors were unbiased, but with a coefficient of variation of 100%. So 100% of the time I might be wrong in uh, getting the precipitation errors. Um, the uh, particle bed smoothers uh, requires a little bit of a large ensemble, so we use 200 as an ensemble member, and we added additional uncertainties on other um, on other features. So model parameters. Uh, so we use a very simple snow model, snow 17, um, and then we also oops, uh, we also added uncertainty on air temperature. Forcings were taken from era five, and we assimilated one observation every month. The um, graphic that popped up here uh, shows the results for one in situ location where we had observations of the actual snowfall. So you'll see kind of like the reference uh, snowfall error uh, factor as shown here. Um, and then you'll see the distribution of that prior um, correction factor, precipitation factor in, in red. So again, this is really just representing that log, nor log normal uh, distribution that I um, that I assigned. Um, so the posterior is instead represented in in blue, and so you'll see that uh, the uh, location really and the uh, of the um, and the distribution of the posterior <coughs> error factors in precipitation looks much more like the um, the reference um, point at the in situ location. What that looks like in terms of snow depth is shown, and also cumulative snowfall. Uh, it's shown in this uh, in this graphic here, where you see the dotted line represents cum cumulative snowfall for the posterior case and prior case. So posterior after the assimilation of, of snow depth, prior before the assimilation of snow depth. So again, in my graphics, usually whenever you see an ensemble, I'm showing the interquantile range. So the um, uh, 25 and 75 percentile shows the envelope and the uh, dash and the sorry thick line represent the median um, of the uh, prior case in, in red and posterior case in blue. You see the in situ observations and then probably if you squint your eyes you also see the locations of the observations that I assimilate that are located by these um, circle, um, green circle represented here. So key points here is that in going from oh, before the assimilation to after the, the assimilation we get closer to the observation that we're actually assimilating and also the uncertainties around the um, the estimates get reduced for you know better or worse, but um, it does get reduced and it get closer to the um, to the truth in this case uh, or to reference snow depth observation. So that was for the in situ uh, case. Uh, now in this case, um, I'm actually using Sentinel One snow depth over the entire watershed. Um, so what you'll see in this top uh, graphic, you'll see again that distribution of what the error in snowfall might look like prior to my estimate. So not surprising, it's just centering one because of the specific um, um, distribution that I, uh, I used to, 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 to use. Um, the prior uh, snowfall um, does resemble some of the uh, topographic patterns and uh, just a caveat that I didn't mention that's because I also do some uh, sort of statistical downscaling in their air temperature of uh, era 5 so that just to improve a little bit better that um, gr uh, grid the pattern on air temperature that will lead to prior estimate of snow water equivalent. After assimilating the snow depth, you'll see how those errors in um, snowfall um, does, they do take more of that um, topographic pattern. So you see some uh, gradients uh, associated to, um, again, elevation uh, in the um, snowfall errors that then therefore adjust the snowfall distribution depending on elevation. So you'll see how, for example, um, snowfall is removed a little bit in the lower elevation, so where you see more of the red, uh, and then we add the snowfall precipitation in the higher elevation to lead to, uh, again, posterior estimate of snow water equivalent. 
Yeah. First look to test if this is really working uh, was done in collaboration with some of the colleagues at the University of Trento. They ran their uh, semi-lamp um, streamflow model when I um, give them inputs as inputs, my snow water equivalent estimates from prior and posterior, and also the um, related snow melt. And what we saw is that um, despite having little improvement in the actual um, long-term stream flow events, and this is a, a statistic KGE uh, that, you know, ideally you will want this to be one in order to be able to um, say that your model uh, actually is doing great, the greatest job at estimating observations. But when we talk the log normal uh, of the, um, of the um, stream flow, we've noticed that the improvement was much higher. And that's really because most of the improvements is coming from uh, the time when we have um, low flow. And that's potentially because by adding and correcting um, snow in the higher elevation, we are essentially adding snow that was you know, not able to be represented before uh, without the estimation in the higher elevation that slowly um, does melt and provides better uh, stream flow during um, the um, spring and summer runoff. So that was it for uh, the application on precipitation errors. And now I shift a little bit gear and start talking about other applications that um, are centered around uh, some work that I started when I was a NASA Goddard that looks at um, the applications when we use data simulation of terrestrial water storage uh, using GRACE and GRACE follow on uh, estimation and soil moisture, and namely uh, using SMAP and SMOS data simulation. Before jumping into uh, the actual applications, I again want to give a quick overview of uh, the data simulation systems uh, that involve GRACE and soil and moisture uh, application, just to know that we are more or less on the same page and we know where, what, what they really mean by uh, this type of data simulation. So to start off with, uh, we'll start with GRACE. Uh, so uh, for those of you that are not familiar with GRACE and GRACE follow-on missions, uh, they are uh, gravity missions and they uh, measure uh, terrestrial water storage. Uh, that can be seen as really the summation of all of the water that is uh, stored um, over and under the land. So think about this as a summation of groundwater, snow, um, soil moisture, um, the, the water that is in the, um, in, the, in the vegetation and so on. Uh, so you've probably seen GRACE uh, in highlights was great because it provided, uh, you know, maybe for the first time, a, um, a way to measure, um, to identify global uh, changes of the water mala, water bus balance around the world. So has been used for detecting ice loss, um, groundwater depletion, and so on. Uh, but one of the uh, key, one, not one, but some of the key limitations of GRACE and GRACE follow-on um, comes with the fact that um, their resolution, so vertical resolution, so as I said, well, it's great because it provides an entire um, value for the entire terrestrial water storage, but it doesn't really tell you where that water is stored, whether that's groundwater, whether that's snow, soil moisture, and so on. Uh, also, the um, horizontal resolution of these missions tend to be around 300, 400 kilometer resolution. And if you're familiar with California, that's about the width of the state of California. And uh, also the temporal resolution is um, quite coarse, but coarse or monthly uh, temporal resolution. So if you're looking and using GRACE for say regional scale application, um, hydrological scale application, and you want to look at the various individual components, then you're kind of like out of luck and you need to come, uh, you need to um, do some work prior to be able to use it. And this some work uh, is something that um, we proposed in using um, data simulation to really just do a downscaling of these uh, great uh, measurements, but they have uh, some limitations. So make sure that we overcome, again, the limitation of the observations. Uh, so then we can make um, the observation useful in a way for uh, more regional applications of, um, of hydrology. So the way that uh, uh, the idea behind data simulation again of GRACE works is again as a downscaling mechanism uh, of these GRACE observations. 
Um, in this specific case, um, the, I'm presenting results where the model that we use is the catchment and surface model, so the land model that um, the global modeling and assimilation of, office uses in their uh, geo uh, suites of models. Um, so uh, the model uh, predicts terrestrial water storage, so in that quantity that is also observed by GRACE, uh, by really summing up all of the various components of water that are included in the model. And in this case, they are li listed here with numbers just for simplicity. So catchment deficit is what we use as our proxy of a groundwater of the model. Um, then we have um, surface soil moisture with some soil moisture components, and then also other um, water uh, storage components such as snow and canopy. One limitation of the results that I'll show is that in this case, I use a model that didn't have uh, lakes or river storages, so some of the um, you know, water components that might be included into the uh, observations are not really modeled by uh, the specific model that I'm using. So again, um, we have a model that predicts terrestrial water storage, and then we have, on the other hand, the observations that produce that terrestrial water storage, but again, of course, um, in uh, space and time. So again, the idea behind data simulation is to try and to take advantage of the uh, finer, in a way, uh, spatial resolution. In this case, I'm using 36 kilometer resolution of model experiments in order to be able to downscale to uh, finer scales, those um, coarser observations of grace terrestrial water storage. So in a way, take advantage of the model structure uh, to refine uh, the coarse resolution of grace terrestrial water storage observations. So how do we know that uh, this assimilation is actually working? Um, we compare it to uh, in situ observations. So this is what you will see in these uh, slides here. Every dot here represents um, in situ observations of surface soil moisture, roots on soil moisture, and groundwater. So these are independent validation. Um, and uh, uh, the colors represent um, differences in skills. Skill is here shown in terms of correlation. Um, and uh, again, this is showing differences as in data simulation minus the model only, model only that is often also called open loop. So the idea is that if you see a blue dot, it means that by assimilating a grace uh, observation, we are actually doing better, a better job. Uh, but if you see red, we are actually making things a little bit worse. Um, so the bottom graphic here shows the rest of water storage. That's not really an independent observation because that's directly the observation that I'm using for the assimilation. That's it, it's just here for reference. Um, so it would be a problem if you see red around here because that means that we are assimilating. There's something wrong with the assimilation. So it's just good to see that the assimilation is actually getting closer to the observation that I'm, uh, that I'm using, but it's not again an independent validation. But bottom well, the line here to make is that uh, most of the improvements happen in the groundwater estimates, but we do have a mixed result uh, for roots on soil moisture and surface soil moisture. So again, when I worked at uh, um, NASA Goddard, we said, why, how can we actually improve the entire um, soil moisture column? And uh, again, we said that, so well, why don't we take advantage of um, these dedicated soil moisture emissions such as SMAS and SMAP and the assimilation that uh, we do, uh, we're using these type of observations uh, in order really to provide better estimates of the entire uh, column of water. So just as a, a reference, uh, there are existing, there are um, two uh, main uh, soil moisture dedicated missions, uh, one from uh, the European Space Agency and one from NASA. They are similar in terms of the spatial uh, and temporal resolution that they observed, um, and also in terms of uh, the brightness temperature um, that, they, uh, that they observed. Um, they are, however, uh, in a way only sensitive to um, the surface layers of soil moisture. So they can't really uh, provide a whole lot of information of that roots on soil moisture. That's exactly in a way what we need. We are trying to uh, improve the surface layers because we said, well, Grace was actually able to get to that bottom layer of groundwater. So uh, in this work, again, I'm uh, merging uh, the assimilation of 
uh, soil moisture. Uh, that is for those of you that are uh, familiar with the level four uh, soil moisture uh, product from SMAP. Um, it's a very similar concept. So it uses the same model that um, I used for the uh, TWS, uh, so GRACE simulation, except that we coupled also a calibrated radiating transfer model. And that's really so that we can the model can talk the same language of the observation. So we can actually translate soil moisture quantities into dryness temperature. Then, then we can compare uh, to the observed ones. So then we can generate increments within the assimilation scheme, in this case, an ensemble chemical filter. So we can generate increments of soil moisture, uh, translating them into surface roots and soil moisture to eventually create continuous estimate of surface root zone and soil moisture estimates. So the uh, slide that I'm showing here is the exact same slide that you that I show a couple of minutes ago. But now I'm going to show you the results of um, you know, the validation results of when we only estimate, in this case, small brightness temperature observations. So not surprisingly, now you see that most of the uh, improvements still happen in the top layers. Um, and so you have a lot of the improvements happening in the top layers, whereas um, groundwater and TWS actually do see some sort of degradation. But the general idea is that what if, again, we put them both of them together, now you see that the improvements of the um, univariate assimilation of soil moisture and uh, TWS leads to, in a way, um, the best results, in a way that uh, the combination of the uh, assimilation leads to the best profile soil moisture. All right, so now that we gave a brief, hopefully it was not uh, too technical overview of what the um, assimilation of uh, grace and, and soil moisture does, um, the first application that I will go over uh, is looking at landslide. And the work has been carried by uh, a student at KU Leuven, and that is also shown in the picture over here. So the basic idea of her work was, uh, well, to understand really if uh, there was any benefit by assimilating these uh, satellite products such as trace and soil moisture uh, from SMAP or SMOS, or SMOS um, to benefit landslide monitoring. And the overall idea is that whenever you have increases in soil moisture or water table rise, what happens, you have um, a, a chunk of, of soil that is heavier, and therefore you are increasing the, the shear stress that can lead to uh, landslide. But you're also, oops, sorry, but you're also uh, decreasing the shear strength at the um, interface uh, of, the, of the soil layers. So in this case, um, this is, uh, these are again pictures from uh, Anne's paper. What I'm showing are two examples of landslides, one happening in Canada uh, at the dashed line location and one happening in Colombia. So the landslide in, in, uh, in Canada was noted to be like of medium size. Um, and then if you notice, it was triggered by a, a downpour event. So this is representing catchment deficit. Um, so in a way, the opposite of how much saturation your uh, the catchment is. So you have a um, the lands landslide that was triggered by essentially a, um, a downpour event that therefore led to more saturation in your um, in, in, the, in the basin. Whereas the one in Colombia, if you notice, um, there wasn't really a um, a rainfall event happening. This is now showing so surface soil moisture. So there's not really a, a big rainfall happening the day of the uh, landslide, but you had um, very wet condition uh, before the, the landslide had happened. So again, the examples here are really just meant to show that uh, individual landslides do not really happen because of uh, specific unique um, conditions, but it's more of a combination of all different um, conditions. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, though, on both cases, if you notice, the data simulation um, versus, with respect to the open loop in both cases would have led to uh, wetter conditions and therefore most likely um, increase the chances of having um, had uh, increased perhaps the landslide alert. 
So then Anne went down and said, well, can we try, this is just for two examples, can we try to generalize and understand a little bit better um, where and why uh, these, data, these data simulation experiments have uh, a net positive impact in characterizing landslide monitoring. And uh, um, because there is not really, what we really want to know is the probability of the landslide occur given a specific wetness. In these specific slides, I'm just reporting roots on soil moisture, but this could be written in terms of groundwater and so on. But again, because there is not enough, uh, in a way, in situ data of soil moisture or groundwater that could cause um, landslide events, um, the work that she conducted was more um, thinking of this in terms of the Bayesian uh, approach. So again, in theory, we want to know the probability of a landslide to occur given a specific um, root zone soil moisture in this case, but that can also be rewritten in a way and be proportional to the percentile of um, the root zone soil moisture given a specific landslide events that have occurred just to characterize whether the, the data simulation is actually improving or not. And then finally, in a way to evaluate uh, the added value of the, assimilate, of the assimilation, um, she calculated um, or in a way counted uh, the number of times that uh, in this case, again, the root zone soil moisture would have changed um, that increased, so then lead to uh, wetter condition and therefore higher landslides alert or decrease, so then possibly um, decrease um, like the wetness and therefore lead to false alarm for landslides. So her generalization is um, shown in these slides. Um, so yes, we can generalize this. The answer was yes, we can generalize it, but um, the um, there's not really a clear um, data simulation impact uh, that, that we see uh, by uh, doing data simulation. If any though, uh, there is a general uh, increase um, in uh, um, landslide probabilities because all of the data simulation um, cases led to higher um, number of, uh, of soil moisture in this case uh, increases that might have led to um, higher um, increases in, in this landslide, landslides alert. The second example or application that I'm giving is again work that has been carried out by a student of mine, uh, Sophie Ruhr, um, and she's looking at uh, vegetation product productivity or specifically kind of water controls on vegetation productivity that then have it therefore a um, link to uh, carbon uh, cycling. So her work kind of like sparkled with these questions, like is there any implication uh, on um, uh, groundwater, um, oh sorry, vegetation production during period of droughts and how is groundwater in a way um, helping or not helping during droughts uh, for vegetation productivity. So the work that she has been doing uh, eventually will uh, look at, uh, answer these questions, like how does interannual variability of groundwater, uh, water table depth will affect uh, plant productivity during periods of drought. Um, so eventually here, I'll say she will be using um, groundwater estimates from the um, data simulation products that I showed from Grace and Grace follow on. But to test her hypothesis of whether there is actually an effect on water table depth to plant productivity, she used um, a station that uh, has uh, observed long-term uh, observations of uh, plant productivity, GPP, and also had a series of instruments um, that measure soil moisture, uh, water table depth, again, groundwater, and also tree growth. And that location is at the Tonsi uh, Ranch Flax Tower uh, in California. In order to test uh, this question, uh, what she did, she um, came up with um, three or four known parametric models. And in these uh, slides, I'll just show random forest uh, models where uh, she predicts GPP anomalies, uh, again, based on the observations here. Uh, and in these uh, models, uh, she used two versions of the model, what she calls the full model and the no WTD model, so no water table depth. 
In the full model, uh, there are all of the variables that she includes, like all the um, independent variables that might lead, that we know they lead to um, plant productivity. So soil moisture, um, air temperature, light amount of light, um, pressure deficit, vapor pressure deficit, and water table depth, so the groundwater. And then in the second model, she used exactly the same models, but leaving out the water table depth. And then she analyzes the residuals between the two models, and she analyzed that as a function of water table depth. So in these slides, you'll see, uh, again, this is just for one of our model, uh, showing the, you know, how decent the model is in terms of representing those observed GPP. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you'll see a graphic that now uh, shows that GPP residuals. So now these are anomalies. So these are, uh, in a way, um, Z score, right? Uh, so they don't have a unit. But you'll see how, for a period of droughts, uh, water table depth percentiles lead to increased GPP um, uh, when, again, the um, plant is actually has more availability of water in the groundwater um, dynamics. So in other terms, period of drought, um, if plants have uh, access, access to water table depth, they will increase um, GPP productivity. And in this case, she found that that was about 20% increase in water table depth um, controls on GPP. So similarly, she did a similar analysis, uh, but instead of looking at GPP, now she was looking at growth. Um, and growth is uh, something that she estimated from tree ring data. So looking at every year how uh, much a tree was growing. So again, that's uh, another term of carbon fixation. So not longer productivity, but the actual fixation of the carbon on the plant. Um, and then same story, she noticed that uh, water table depth percentiles led to higher growth uh, in, of the tree. Uh, and uh, do, again, during uh, dry condition and these water table depth conditions increase uh, that growth by approximately 17.7%, um, again, uh, due to um, wetter uh, water table depth conditions. The uh, next application that I'm looking at is uh, uh, work that I've done with um, a postdoc of mine that is now working at Goddard uh, Space Flying Center, Tasnuva. So she started looking into um, how we can use this type of data simulation uh, for agriculture purposes. So the idea behind this project started when, again, a couple of years ago, we uh, assimilated uh, grace observations over India. So India, especially in northern parts of India, we noticed uh, there's a, a, a um, trends in terrestrial water storage that has been documented um, as a uh, depletion of the groundwater storage due to irrigation purposes. But so when we assimilated this terrestrial water storage over India, we noticed that, well, in the model only we don't have these um, uh, trends because the model that we use do not really have groundwater pumping or irrigation purpose to, or the irrigation processes in it. But the data simulation was actually able to uh, introduce the trend in uh, uh, terrestrial water storage correctly because that's linked to a reduction of um, groundwater uh, because of human driven processes. However, we started looking at other uh, fluxes uh, such as evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration, of course, didn't have any trends in the model only because there was no trends introducing the terrestrial water storage. And we noticed that there was no trends also in observed, like independently observed evapotranspiration. But there was a trend in the data simulation system. And we thought, well, this trend is really unrealistic. And it's an unrealistic uh, reduction of evapotranspiration fluxes because uh, the model thinks that uh, you're removing water from the groundwater systems, you're removing water from the entire column of water, and therefore you have a um, reduction of evapotranspiration. But what the model does not know is that you're actually putting that water that you're removing from the groundwater system up to the top uh, for irrigation purposes. So in other terms, the water that we are removing from the uh, deeper, maybe, uh, groundwater storages is placed back into the system, but the model doesn't have a way to represent this. So the model, in a way, didn't have the right physics to uh, accommodate 
uh, this type of um, assimilation system. So the first step uh, to improve upon this um, uh, this problem in data simulation system was to um, come up with, in a way, I want to say better model, but a model that um, in a way better represent these human driven processes. And this is the work that again, uh, we are currently working on uh, where we introduced an irrigation scheme um, into the uh, land surface model. And then we will try to repeat the experiment of assimilating again, the grace uh, and mentally surface soil moisture uh, data to hopefully improve the entire hydrological uh, systems. So the final application that I will uh, touch base upon is again a work that I've been doing with another student, a master student and uh, Sheliga. And she uh, looked at um, the implication of uh, using data simulation to better improve sea level, sea level rise variability um, of, 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 uh, you know, uh, of, of the globe. So um, the reason for this, one of the motivation for this work is that, well, I'm not gonna uh, tell you that land is the main contributor of sea level rise. So we know that sea level rise comes from, most of the sea level rise comes from ice and the expansion of the ocean. But what I would like to uh, say here is that if you look at the variability of um, the sea level rise, uh, and then you look at the contribution of land, you'll see how land is one of the main source of variability of sea level rise. And again, a couple of years ago, a study uh, by um, JT River um, showed that um, long-term actually variability and long-term changes of terrestrial water storage uh, over land um, had the potential to actually change and affect both the short-term but also long-term variability of global sea level rise. So the um, some of the main um, finding that uh, he studied um, showed was that again climate variability resulted in more uh, water uh, being stored over land, so less in the ocean, and that um, land water losses, uh, so more in the ocean. Um, was resulting from ice sheet, glacier, uh, and groundwater pumping. So my student has tried to revisit this study, uh, both from an observation perspective and a model perspective. So observation perspective is essentially uh, the same numbers that um, earlier JT uh, Rieger came up with that uh, led to you know, a small increase of sea level rise due to um, uh, land TWS. Um, a contrary uh, seems to be seen by the model only. And then of course, data simulation stands in between the two. But again, the work that she's conducting now is trying to disentangle like the causes really for uh, these two uh, discrepancies when it comes down from model and observation. The fact that the model, you know, if you were just to do predictions from the model, you might have a little bit of the decrease of um, sea level rise uh, associated to land surface, uh, to terrestrial water storage over land, uh, whereas the, the observation tell you a different story. So again, trying to disentangle the processes to why we have these differences, so then eventually we can uh, feed them back into the models to have better, uh, hopefully, prediction of future sea level rise uh, changes. All right, so that was enough of application. So I'm just going to uh, try to wrap up in the next few slides with some of the maybe remaining challenges that we have in the land data simulation system that in a way prevents a little bit uh, the um, fully um, use maybe or exploitation of these her system observations into, system, into uh, our you know, applications. And uh, uh, for that, I'll start by using a quote by uh, a paper that came out I think, a couple of years ago uh, that talked about uh, data simulation um, and said, well, the devil, the devil is in the details in terms of obtaining optimal estimates for hydrologic systems from assimilating remote sensing measurements into models. So the way that I read this is also how do we handle, in a way, a lot of these observations? So. In the uh, right panel here, you'll see um, all of the observations great from NASA, uh, both uh, in orbit, planned, or future. Um, and the, the way the reason why I brought that up is that um, we learned that these observations are in a way great. They 
are complementary to one another, they are increasing. Uh, but in a way, I think we are still not capable from a land data submission uh, perspective to fully exploit these observations in a comprehensive manner for then, you know, um, provide um, useful information and that we can use for these uh, global uh, environmental science applications. And again, a lot of these difficulties come from the fact that we have different spectral, spatial, temporal resolution. Um, and so how do we best merge all of these observations so then we do good rather than doing harm? An idea that came out again last year uh, from uh, this perspective paper was, um, why don't we try to leverage upon uh, all of the advances that data science have done uh, in order to you know, be able to uh, deal with this amount of, of data, this large amount of data. So again, the idea is, can we um, again use um, or work together with uh, data scientists that have learned on how to use a large amount of data um, so then we can fully uh, realize that potential of Earth observations. So one way to do so is again, very um, maybe, um, using all of the observations that said, well, they are all different spatial temporal resolution. And can we use, again, this data science machine learning to make a variable that is a little bit more recognizable by uh, models and engineers? So here at Berkeley, I had the opportunity also to work with some data scientist students. And this is a work that they conducted last year in terms of one of their project. And they um, tried to do this in the terms of snow. So they grabbed a bunch of, um, uh, satellite observations and uh, the analysis data uh, that all have, of course, different spatial, spectral, temporal resolution. Um, and then they did their magic with data science and they came up with estimate of snow water equivalent. So again, variables that are more recognizable by our physical based models um, and also scientists, water practitioners and so on. Another way though that I think um, machine learning or data science can help us is a lot of the processes that um, we currently are facing. Some of them are not fully physically, uh, we can't fully physically um, model them anymore. And uh, of course, I had had some experience with human driven processes, uh, some of the groundwater, um, so how can we, again, leverage upon uh, the, uh, all of the data that we have from satellites and um, all of the advancement that we made uh, with data science in order to be able to better also model, in a way, some of these processes? So, again, a suggestion that I would have here, can we, again, work together with some of these um, you know, AI uh, experts in order to be able, I'm not saying substitute completely our physical based models, but helped uh, them uh, in order to be better able uh, to uh, estimate these ideological physical based models. So with that, I just want to come up with my summary and conclusions. I hope I convince you that uh, data simulation is a great tool that can bridge both models and earth observations. Um, I gave you a lot of information about uh, applications that can use these uh, uh, data simulation tools. Um, some uh, successful, some still in the process. Uh, but again, I also hope that I gave you a little bit of a glimpse of what some of the um, uh, challenges we are still facing and maybe ways that we can um, address these challenges. Um, and with that, I hope we have time for some questions and thank you for listening. Thank you. Yes, we absolutely have time for questions. Um, so as always, everyone, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself to ask a question. You can raise your hand if you'd like me to cue you or if you don't have a microphone, you can type it in the chat and I will read it out loud. So uh, I maybe I can <laughs> take advantage of my uh, coordinator uh, role. So uh, have you thought about uh, given that um, the small satellites are rapidly uh, emerging um, and which can have um, the advantage of um, 
more frequent repeat time and uh, no cost. Um, so can you can comment about how we can uh, make use of the data generated from the small satellite to help uh, out with the uh, data assimilation. You say, uh, how can we use SMOS archive? The, the small satellite, um, I know um, NASA um, um, has been uh, uh, developing some small satellite missions. Um, have you thought about how we can um, uh, uh, make use of the small satellite or develop um, further more small satellite missions to help on um, the data assimilation um, and in applications such as uh, soil moisture and uh, water underground. I'm 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 afraid that I do not understand, or maybe I'm not familiar with <clears throat> the I don't know data set or system that you mentioned. But it seems like it's a way to uh, increase the number of observations and number of um, maybe temporal and spatial resolution of a specific observations. Is that what um, what it is? Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, specifically. Uh, when we uh, when when you, when you study the soil moisture um, and um, the the data you get from uh, from those uh, SMAMP or SMAS, uh, those are uh, traditional big satellite. Um, uh, is there a way to uh, replace them with um, a constellation of small satellite? Um, oh, small satellites. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I think, yes. So I think there's, uh, again, a lot of exciting, um, I don't, I don't want to say replace them, but I think maybe again, using them in comp complementarity with them. Um, I um, think that there's a lot of exciting, exciting things happening, for example, the hydro nests that are using a lot of small cube satellites um, to maybe increase the um, um, you know, temporal revisit around the globe. So then you can get more observations. Uh, so of course, having more observations will lead to more observation that you can use in the data simulation system, provided that you want to make sure that you also take into account for the fact that some of them might be um, you know, autocorrelated. So they might contain the same sort of information. So you want to you know, make sure that you remove for that. I don't know if that answered your question. All right, thanks. You're welcome. So we do have a question in the chat. Um, Theodore, do you want to read it out loud, or do you want to ask it verbally, or should I read it out loud? Okay, I'm going to read it out loud. <laughs> oh, it doesn't have a mic. Okay. So Theodore asks, you shared some really interesting applications of data assimilation, and I am wondering if you have any future projects or applications you are particularly excited about exploring further. Hmm. Well, I think that in a way, the last two applications that I gave you about agriculture and sea level rise are still on the go, so they are not very complete, so I'm excited about seeing how those are going. Um, also, um, some applications related to uh, forecasting, it's like a lot of the time um, we do um, data simulation, land data simulation to, to improve hydrological states, but what we can also do is um, improving initial states of, say, forecasting models. Uh, so trying to improve um, those uh, forecast, um, I'm talking about weather and seasonal forecasting by improving those initial conditions because we constrain uh, them with uh, you know, better land uh, surface conditions also another exciting project that I think um, I, I'd like to take my research in too. Thank you for the question. We have quite a few um, chat questions, but I like to encourage people to speak aloud just so uh, it's always best people can understand the questions. Oh, well, yeah, I, I posted a question. Um, so uh, thanks for the nice talk. I'm just wondering, uh, for the problems uh, you discussed, uh, are there any open or benchmark data sets, uh, for example, as a data scientist or machine learning researcher, we can use to uh, test or develop new uh, machine learning methods? I know many of those data uh, may be already posted online, but uh, we don't really have the knowledge to pre-process those and then uh, try to know uh, what are the expected outputs. Um, so I'm just wondering whether there are some pre-processed data sets that are available for use. 
So when I work with my with the students that are data scientists, I encourage always them to talk with someone that is an expert in like the actual uh, field. So um, as you mentioned, like there are the data are available, or you might not know, you know, how to to develop to use them or what they are. So my recommendation will always be to try and talk to someone that is an expert in the field that can guide you to understanding the various data set that can be available for a specific problem. Yeah, yeah. So uh, currently, we do have some collaborations where uh, we're getting those data sets and problem from. Uh, I'm thinking uh, if there can be some open benchmark data where everyone can read and use, maybe it's going to encourage other people in machine learning field to develop new methods for this. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, I, and maybe I think that the direction that we are going with the, you know, all the cloud systems, um, Google Earth Engine and so on, maybe that's also a, providing a platform to where all of these things can be shared and, 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 and work together in groups, maybe. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Mm, hello? Yeah. I don't know if you hear me. Yeah, yeah good. Um, yeah, I'm... Um, I'm actually working in a project of assimilating uh, live in situ soil moisture data for mm -hmm. with the uh, SMAP uh, data for uh, agricultural purposes. And I'm just wondering what would you see as like challenges or uh, things to consider? Thank you. Getting data for validation, um, making sure that you have a good data set to validate your result. I think that that was one of the main uh, issue that um, my postdoc I faced. Uh, it's like once you do these type of experiments, you need to have also a good data set to validate your data with. So having an experimental um, ground set in the field to get you know data, that's probably the main challenge that I will see. Okay, thank you. Great, Liang's been waiting for a second, so I want to I want to prompt you. Okay, uh, thank you for the great uh, seminar. So I had a, a question regarding the procedure for data simulation. So we are working on uh, to do uh, the seasonal prediction. So then the question would be, how long do you think the initial data assimilation will be necessary? Uh, to uh, in a, in order to be able to get uh, any skill from the seasonal, so the reason I'm asking is that uh, we tried, for example, making as much as possible the initial condition of soil moisture, but that doesn't really uh, help much if you're taking a seasonal prediction like a download, you know, six months later. So I think there is some uh, methods. Uh, which we really need to consider the spin up of how long the system really can carry the information. And, and that carry information, it's not just one variable because any co incoherent between soil moisture and the temperature or between soil moisture or snow, so it will really affect the results tremendously. The signal we lost. I wonder if the to answer that question is is really like it depends again on you know where you're looking at because I know the soil moisture might not have an impact in six months from now but in some areas that you know have more of a um, I want to say temporal history uh, of of the variable you might have a longer um, effect on that uh, variable of interest. Like for example, maybe groundwater is a, a a storage that varies much less dynamically than soil moisture, so that might have more of an impact. I I want to say on maybe seasonal to subseasonal forecasting. Um, so I I think to answer that question, it really depends on where you're looking at, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the specific temporal scales of of the variable of, of interest that you're looking at and understanding which one have, you know, more of a, um, like less of a temporal um, dynam dy dynamics and then the information can stay longer in the system. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So that's, that's a typically we would understand because uh, there's a problem, of course, uh, also very much depend on the availability of data, the ground, uh, you know, the groundwater information is pre currently, I think it's really 
not good enough for us to do uh, assimilation in that regard. So that's one. Uh, the most available data currently, I think we are looking at is the uh, uh, snow uh, cover, uh, snow liquid water, uh, snow water content uh, equivalent, which we found is mostly, I mean, if you look at the, over the whole United States or over whole big continent, the snow cover in the winter actually have much more signal uh, for the seasonal prediction than soil moisture. The soil moisture is really too fast process. Yeah, yeah but snow persists a little bit longer, so it has more right. of a... Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, I have two more, if that's okay. Sure. Ah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I have one from um, Yu Long. Yu Long, do you want to ask your question verbally, or should I read it out loud? I'll give you a uh, yes, I, I can ask. Uh, for example, you you did uh, the uh, snow DA use the snow seventeen. Mm -hmm. I know snow seventeen is a very simple model, but it's useful. But uh, my question is. Uh, do you compare your methodology use the the simple or uh, simple model and uh, use another complex model and uh, and the catchment uh, uh, no MP CLM or the GFDL LSM for something complex model to use your methodology and compare do we have advantage from a complex model or the Simple model performer is much better than the com complex model after your DA methodology be, uh, was used. Did you think yeah. about that part? Yeah, yeah, I thought about it. Uh, so we started with a very simple method because we really just wanted to test the methodology and see if we were able to actually get better estimates, even with a simple model of um, stream flow and the, the prediction. So the idea is that if you can get that with a very simple model, Hopefully, having a, hopefully in theory, having a more complicated and more physical based model, um, the results can only improve from, from there. So I think in a way we wanted to start with something simple that was easy to, uh, to test uh, with and that can be um, in a way um, just the starting baseline for um, improving things even further. Yeah. Hopefully, see the complex model will get a, a little bit better. Otherwise, sometimes That's the simple model is good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more question in my queue, and that's from Corinne Carter. Corinne, you can go ahead and mute. Yes. Uh, could evapotranspiration or vegetation condition data be assimilated into your model? Well, when we talked that when I talked about CLSM, uh, the model, the physical based model, I say yes, because there are some variables that have evapotranspiration and vegetation. Um, actually, uh, I think there's work that is currently being done by um, by the NASA Global and uh, Global Modeling Assimilation Office that looks at exactly at that. Um, but I haven't done that myself. Uh, but I think in theory it is possible, not on the snow model, because I'm, I'm using a very simple model that doesn't really have. Uh, vegetation or evapotranspiration, but um, the physical based model that I use for the grace and um, and soil moisture, in theory, I'd say yes. Okay, thank you. Do we have any last minute questions? That's it for my for my queue. I know we're a little bit over time. Okay, well, thank you um, very much, our wonderful speaker, for giving us this great talk and uh, kicking off our spring 2023 seminar series. This was this was the perfect beginning. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for attending. Um, just as John said, we have a wonderful um, selection of speakers this semester. Um, go to any one of our emails, and you can see that, or just email us. We I'm sure you're used to seeing our emails. Um, and then we also have some in-person seminars coming up. So we look forward to seeing you in person. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming and listening and for inviting me. Yeah, of course, of course. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye.